Well, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> um, welcome to this um, slightly unusual CSAR. And I'm very grateful to our council member, uh, Dr. Robin Catchpole, for stepping into the breach. Uh, as you probably gathered from the <clears throat> notes going around, our scheduled speaker had a, um, a serious family commitment, um, which meant that she wasn't able to join us. And I'm sure you will join me in sending her uh, our best wishes for a, a speedy recovery. Um, Dr. Catchpole is uh, an eminent member of the Institute of Astronomy in the uh, University of Cambridge and is um, very kindly stepped up to talk to us about whether we're going to blown, be blown to smithereens by stuff coming out of space. I'd put that rather clumsily, as is my wont, I'm afraid, but um, Dr. Catchpole, Please talk to us. Okay, thank you very much. Now, asteroids, comet, should we worry? Okay, I want to take you back to the morning of the 15th of February, 2013, when an object entered the atmosphere from the east over the city of Chelyabinsk. It was traveling at 18 kilometers per second and trailing a column of smoke. At about 9.20, it exploded at a height of about 30 kilometers with a flash that lasted about five seconds and a detonation. And you will see an arrow here and on other subsequent pictures, um, you will see the arrow points in the direction that the object arrived. Now, we're very fortunate that thanks to the lawlessness of Russian drivers, lots of people there have dashboard cameras. And this allowed an accurate triangulation of the trajectory, uh, which in turn allowed us to deduce the original orbit. There we are, top left. Just follow, see how bright it gets on the ground the flash and the object disappears off into the distance. Now, there was a three minute interval between the flash in the sky and the um, pressure wave, shock wave arriving at the ground. And this gave people the chance to either rush to windows or um, rush outside. And about 1500 people were injured by, mainly by flying glass. So um, here we are. This is uh, a few little um, extracts from cameras. And you see gets knocked to the ground. Um, security cameras. Security cameras. And you'll hear some successive bangs there. And here inside a factory, the windows are blown in. And these office scenes, early morning, security, guy gets a bit of a fright. They get up, there's a guy down on the right here. They check he's all right, and they all rush out. And, oh yes, and more factory doors being blown in by the blast, giving you some idea of um, the effect of this, um, this aerial explosion. This is rather charming. They're obviously having a nice little chat. And he turns out to be quite chivalrous because he wants to check she's okay before he hassles her outside, of the, outside the door. So another example here. The arrival of the, and you will hear successive blasts. It was thought that the object that came in weighed about 10,000 tons, maybe 20 meters in diameter. And the total energy liberated here was something like 440 kilotons. That's um, the way of measuring nuclear blasts, uh, kilotons of um, TNT. 
that's about 20 to 30 times the energy of the uh, Hiroshima bomb. And ironically, the very same day, a long predicted close approach of an asteroid occurred about 16 hours later. The two were not related because they were on completely different orbits. But even I remember before this event, um, the probability of us being hit by the asteroid was zero because we knew the orbit accurately enough. But NASA was saying um, the probability of being struck by some other object is far greater than the worry of this particular asteroid and blow me down, something actually arrived that day. Now, this isn't the first uh, boloid or meteorite that's been observed um, um, with cameras. And this takes us back to 1992, the 9th of October, and it's called the Peekskill meteorite in the New York area. And various people filmed it during a football match. But little did 18-year-old um, Michelle Knapp know that one of the fragments was going to hit her car. And um, here you see on the ground there the uh, 12 kilogram fragment, and it's got some paint of the car on. This, by the time it struck the car, was in free fall. So it was no longer on a ballistic tra uh, trajectory, but it went through and uh, rather wrecked her car. It was a second hand Chevy. And actually, she was in luck because this is back in 1992. She sold the Chevy and the meteorite for $69,000. So she did quite well out of that. So the energy comes from kinetic energy. And um, you can use the simple half mv squared. And if we take this example, 10 kilometers a second, a sphere of ice 10 meters in diameter, um, has that equivalent 5,000, um, uh, 5.7 kilotons of TNT. And if we turn the linear um, velocity of this object into the random velocity of the individual molecules, just conserving energy, um, we can use this little equation here. And if we converted this instantly, um, we would have a temperature of 10,000 uh, degrees and a pressure of 45,000 atmospheres within this sphere. Now, of course, as you can see, the energy is not liberated instantaneously, but um, this gives you the sense of the energetics involved. So where do these velocities come from? If we consider the Earth, it's um, in on orbit around the sun, in orbit around the sun at 30 kilometers per second. And um, so we can imagine if we meet something in a circular orbit coming in the opposite direction, it will be uh, a, the total closing velocity will be 60 kilometers a second. So if we think of things like asteroids, then they may be on elliptical orbits of ever increasing ellipticity, in which case the velocity at this point increases from a, a minimum of 30 up to a maximum of 42 kilometers a second. Parabolic orbit corresponds to an object that starts at the with zero velocity at the edge of the solar system. Just by way of comparison, if you think of um, a ballistic weapon on Earth, uh, the maximum velocity they can achieve is about two kilometers per second. And that is about the Earth for a given similar mass has about 200 times the, um, the, the kine kinetic energy per unit mass. Now, a couple of years ago, we saw an object on Muamua that was claimed to be moving through the um, solar system at a velocity greater than the escape velocity, actually 44 kilometers per second. And if we allowed for, um, objects coming from deep interstellar space, then there is no upper limit. We go through a series of hyperbolic orbits um, and the upper limit, well, is um, as large as you like. So, but we find very few objects closing with the Earth at greater than 70 or so kilometers per second. 
Now, just to give you some idea of um, the kinetic energies we're talking about here, here is a jumbo jet at, um, at its cruising speed. There are the parameters there. Its kinetic energy is equivalent to about 1.8 tons of uh, TNT. Now, if you look closely, you will see my suitcase there flying through the air. And my suitcase weighs 17 kilograms. And if my suitcase is traveling at the speed that the Earth orbits the sun, 30 kilometers a second, it will have the same kinetic energy as this entire jumbo jet. It's all that V squared stuff. So if you want to see an impact, well, you just need to go out on a dark night, look up at the night sky long enough, and you might, you will probably see a little uh, meteor um, or uh, crossing the sky. Uh, this will be the size of the grain of sand. Now it comes as a surprise to, certainly came as a surprise to me when I first uh, read this uh, um, statistic, that um, fireballs, these are reported by the US government. What you are looking at here are the 92 impacts with greater than a kiloton of um, energy um, over the last 28 years. And just for um, calibration, there's Hiroshima at 20 kilotons, and there is Chelyabinsk at about 440 kilotons. So these are all um, over a kiloton. And if you want to see what half a kiloton looks like, it looks like this was a, a, a land-based uh, conventional explosion. Um, you see the shock wave through the sea. So we see that about every two and a bit months, there is a half kiloton impact. Every two and a half years or so, there's a 10 kiloton impact. And about every five years, a 20 kiloton impact. So that is, of course, most of these will occur over the sea because 70% of the surface of the earth is covered in sea. Now, during the last hundred years, there have been several noteworthy events. And we go back to the southern Peru on the 15th of September, 2007, 11.40 local time. Bright object was seen falling almost vertically, followed by a loud bang and a small uh, earthquake raising a mushroom cloud. And this actually happened within a few hundred meters of houses. And what they noticed was a foul sulfurous smell as the water, which is from the water table, you see at the bottom of the pit there, um, started boiling as a result of being struck by a sulfur rich uh, chondrite. If we then go back to 1947, 12th of February, um, 10 in the morning, the painter PJ Medvedev was about to start a painting when he looked out of his window and this is what he saw. He saw this a very a bright object, brighter than the sun, crash into the ground and a, a cloud that persisted for about four hours. This took place in the um, uh, Sikotia Leon Mountains. There they are, that's the direction of the impact. And this was in fact an iron um, nickel meteorite of about 90 tons and it did end up making a crater in the ground. Probably almost nobody uh, realizes that back in the 13th of August, 1930, at eight in the morning, um, this is what the regional paper said, the sun became blood red and darkness fell over the region. A large cloud of red dust filled the air, then a fine white ash descended to cover the trees and plants. There then followed ear-piercing piercing, whistling sounds, three in total, after which three mighty explosions, the whole forest became a blazing inferno, which lasted for several months, depopulating a large area. I think the interesting thing to note there is that I suspect the dust and the ash came after, not before the event. Um, and there has been attempt to just find if there is a crater, but again, this seems to have been an airburst. Um, five years later in British Guiana, a gold prospector was awoken during the night and um, 
He observed the next day, he heard this enormous explosion that about 32 um, uh, kilometers of, of forest had been um, destroyed. Again, nobody really um, uh, talks much about that, but everybody remembers the Tunguska event, which goes back to the 30th of June in 1908. And again, uh, you'll see the direction of the object coming in from the southeast. It was traveling about 30 kilometers per second, trailing a column of smoke in, accompanied by intense thunderclaps, and it exploded at um, 717 local time at a height of about six kilometers with, and this is a report again, with a stupendous bang that was th heard a thousand kilometers away. And the ball of fire was one and a half kilometers wide, outshone the sun, rising to a height of about 20 kilometers, and that was seen 400 kilometers away. Um, the interesting thing is, if it had arrived three minutes later, it would have arrived on top of somewhere in Europe. Now, this was a time of great social upheaval in Russia. So the first expedition um, only got to the region um, led by this Leonid Kulik um, in 19 years later in 1927. And they photographed forests um, that were flattened for, this is in 1927, uh, for 70 kilometers or so away from the, um, from the epicenter, and they were scorched, the trees were scorched on one side. Although under the epicenter, the trees were all pointing vertically um, with all the branches stripped off. So about 40 million trees were demolished uh, within 30 kilometers or so. Um, and um, this is a map showing the orientation of the trees and the Russians by sliding explosives down a wire and having a field of matchsticks, not only managed to reproduce this pattern, but um, reproduce the butterfly pattern as well in an attempt to discover which um, um, direction it came. Now, the initial failure to find a crater led to all kinds of wild speculations about the origin of the explosion, um, including, you know, collisions with black holes, spacecraft, and so on and so forth. But um, recent, more um, careful examination, um, it was noted that this Lake Checo lay about seven kilometers uh, down um, range from the epicenter of the explosion. And just to clarify what I'm talking about here, if we look up here, imagining an, an object coming in in this direction, um, it explodes at this point. So this is the epicenter immediately under it, and the impact crater takes occurs down range. And we see an example of this on the surface of Mars. There's the impact crater and underneath this ring is the, is the epicenter. Now, in 2012, an expedition went to this area and examined Lake uh, uh, Checo for magnetic anomalies. And there does appear to be something possibly at the base of the lake, although they've not managed to recover anything. This is a very hostile, a swampy, um, marshy, mosquito-ridden uh, territory. This lake also does not appear on maps. Now, there, this, what I'm going to show you here is a simulation um, made by the um, nuclear people who do the nuclear weapon stuff in Sandia in the US. So it's a box, it's 20 kilometers high and 40 kilometers um, on along the base. And what you will see is an object uh, coming in uh, from the top right there. And what we are seeing is a five megaton explosion. And here it is running backwards. And you will see the two shock fronts. You will see um, how the shock wave strikes the ground here vertically, accounting for the trees, and then the shock fronts move outwards um, along in, on this direction. Now, we'd always thought that this was a very much larger explosion um, in the range, maybe up to 20 megatons. But when they simulated that, then they found that the fireball actually got to the surface, and that clearly was not the case. 
So just to give you a feel for this sort of thing, here is uh, an image taken from a video of a nuclear explosion. And you see the reflected shock wave here and the primary shock wave here. And I just want you um, to look out for this. This is um, in a little uh, video here. Here we see the fireball and now we see the shock waves um, emanating. Um, there they are, there's the reflected one and the forward one. And this probably gives one a feeling as the blast wave, the blast wave traveling more slowly um, moves outwards. This probably gives you the feeling for the sort of um, situation that you would have seen had you been um, near the epicenter. Fortunately, it's a very a little populated area. Okay, that's probably enough of that. Now, to assess the risk, we must um, measure the cratering rate, essentially. And we can look at a pristine surface like the moon, or this actually is Mars, and we can see there is a young region here with less craters than the old region here. There are more craters on the surface. So we can count the cratering rate, and if we can provide some calibration, we can work out um, what the actual cratering rate with time was. We can count the cratering density as a function of size. And what we find, um, and this is a logarithmic diagram with the number of craters greater than one kilometer per square kilometer up this axis here, and time, the formation of the solar system here and today. And what we see in the first um, thousand million years or so is a rapid decline in cratering rate uh, from the late heavy bombardment, which created most of the craters on the moon. And then from about here onwards, this curve um, actually corresponds to a constant cratering rate, which uh, certainly surprised me when I first looked at this, you might think the number of impacts was steadily declining as the solar system gets older. Now, the age calibration, this is all based on um, rock samples brought back from, the, um, from the, the moon by the astronauts that could be dated. And so we could uh, uh, relate various cratering terrains to time to get the cratering rate. And Translated to the Earth, this correspond, this rate is an equivalent to one impact somewhere on Earth creating a crater of more than a kilometer in diameter every 4,700 years or so. And from this uh, data and the distribution of craters, we could work out that a Chelyabinsk event on average would occur about every 33 years and a Tunguska event perhaps every 330 years. Now, of course, we can see um, craters on the surface of the Earth and there are about 190 confirmed impacts and you will see that they're far from evenly uh, distributed over the surface. And this is not because the Almighty has something against Australians. Um, it is just depends on how old the surfaces are, because clearly if you have um, a very high level of erosion and you have young geology, then there hasn't been time for craters. So that accounts for the uneven distribution. And of course, the lack of craters in the sea, we would expect it to be fairly uniform, is at least in part due to that the sea floor is, is very much younger than the continents, quite apart from our ability to find these things. Now, for small impactors, less than 30 meters in diameter, they explode in the air, so there's no crater. From about 50 to 150 meters in diameter, they have what's called a simple crater, as we see in this sequence here, um, the um, melted ejector, and then the fallback of the rock, and then the infill afterwards. So simple craters up to, um, maybe uh, for objects up to 150 meters, um, craters up to five kilometers. And the Barringer crater in Arizona is about 1.2 kilometers, and we think is 50,000 years old. 
Now, for impactors between 500 and 700 meters in diameter, they will form craters from maybe 5 to 20 kilometers in diameter. And what we see here is a two things, a rebound, and then we see a subsequent slumping of material um, as a, enlarging the crater um, um, within days after the event. If we have larger craters, then instead of a simple bump in the middle, we get a ring, as you can see in this example here. These are two, 32 kilometers in diameter. They're about 290 million years old in um, Canada, and they were formed simultaneously. One of the largest and oldest craters in the world is found in South Africa. It's actually called the Freerdefort crater. And if you look carefully, you will see a circular structure there. Um, the original crater was um, this size, about um, uh, 250 kilometers in diameter. And we can date it very accurately at about 2.02 billion years old. Now, what we're going to look at here is the region just inside the, um, this box. And this is a Google Earth. And you see, these, you see these parallel ridges of hills here. This, in fact, is the, um, the inner ring that we see um, of, of after that explosion. The surface you see here was seven kilometers below the surface of the land when the impact occurred. And if we look at rocks from that central era, you will, area, you will see these granites that are about 1,000 million years older. You will see um, this breccia here of um, material that was broken up. And the other diagnostic of craters are these shock cones, these shatter cones, this characteristic overlapping conical structures that we see in quartz. Now, the Freedevort crater does have huge economic Im Im importance because it uplifted strata concentrically around it. And these red are the gold mining areas, are the gold bearing strata. So um, the impact um, brought up to the surface gold that had been laid down before. And from this area alone, something like a third of the gold ever mined about 40,000 metric tons of gold has been um, taken from this area. Now, the most, uh, probably the most well-known and most Im uh, important crater in many respects is this Chicxulub crater dated to 65 million years or so. And what is interesting about this is that in the 1970s, Walter Alvarez and his, and his father, Louis, noted a very strange, um, uh, feature that that is that between the Cretaceous and the beginning of the Paleogene, which used to be called the tertiary era about 65 million years ago, worldwide they found this very thin layer of clay between um, uh, deposits of rock that contained about a hundred times as much iridium as the surrounding rocks. And iridium is um, a typical of, it, it isn't found much in the Earth's surface. It would have um, gone to the center of the Earth. So it is a, a typical signature of impactors. And they suggested that there must have been a massive impact. And so that hypothesis was set before these gravity surveys revealed the presence of this very large um, crater structure. And it, what we know about this crater is essentially derived from oil exploration work. And we think it was about 10 to the 8, um, uh, that's 100 million uh, megatons. We're looking at an explosion here. And again, the crater today is entirely covered by new sediments. Um, and what, uh, so what you see here is a section or so. The instantaneous crater that was formed at the moment of impact was about um, 30 uh, kilometers deep, but it didn't last for very long. Uh, back in 2016, an international ocean discovery program drilled, made some drills um, around near the center of this crater, uh, uh, presumably over here somewhere, 
and they took out a, about an 800 meter core of which 130 meters had been deposited the day the asteroid hit and they were able to give us um, some impression of what actually happened and the what happened was that molten rock um, started to fill the impact hole followed by the, a sort of hailstorm of of other debris that had been hurled into the air seawater surged in churning up the deposit and about 24 hours later a tsunami swept in more material including charcoal from the Im impact uh, induced wildfires. Uh, uh, one of the interesting things, the rocks here are very sulfur rich, but the debris, uh, the breccia is no longer sulfur rich, which suggests the sulfur was all vaporized. And this would have certainly contributed to um, the huge uh, nuclear winter climate catastrophe this triggered. And it does make an important point about craters that um, the consequences depend very much on the rock that is struck. This, in a sense, is if a bit of fun, if you can call such things fun. It is a simulation of the tsunami, and tsunamis are one of the most important, um, uh, most threatening problems of impactors, not least because most of the world, 70% of the world, is covered in ocean. So what we are, you are going to see is a red expanding ring. That ring corresponds to an overpressure of four pounds per square inch. Uh, this is an American thing, which is enough to demolish a building. And OK, let's um, let the thing go. There's the ring. Here comes the tsunami. These um, heights are in meters, the height of the wave. And you will see how it sweeps across what this would look like today. Now, of course, it wasn't like this back 65 million years ago because the Atlantic Ocean was much smaller and the North and South were joined up. What intrigued me was that um, you would have thought the constriction of the, um, at, at, at the, um, into the Mediterranean here would, um, would prevent a, a, a wave going through, but it doesn't. And you can see much of England would have been um, inundated by this um, impact. Uh, there's another, uh, uh, this again has a great commercial significance. The Chesapeake Bay crater is again buried by a lot of latter sediment. It's about 35 million years old. But the, this impact took place on the um, edge of the, on the continental shelf. And the intriguing thing here is, this is highly compressed. Um, in terms of uh, vertical and horizontal scale, we see a central peak and a central ring. This breccia here is um, full of the broken rock from the back falling debris, but it's also saturated with a very highly saline brine. And one of the dangers in, in drilling for water, drilling aquifers, is if you penetrate this brine, you will completely um, destroy your water supply because it's so salty. I just want to talk about one more impact, the Eltonin. It's the only um, impact we know that occurred in the sea. And this impact occurred about 2.15 million years ago, relatively recently. And it may well have had effects on the climate. It may well have had an, uh, um, some uh, general world cooling at just about the time when hominids were um, emerging from Africa. Now, what uh, Eltonin is the name of the survey ship that discovered, did not discover a crater, discovered the uh, a, a strange relief here, probably from the rebound peak, but the ocean floor is covered in um, meteoric fragments, basaltic achondrite, it's referred to. Um, you will see here the uh, simulation of the waves and the tsunami height here. You will see up to 60 meter waves along the New Zealand and parts of the Australian coast. And indeed, we see very large boulders that appear to have been lifted high onto cliffs in this area. 
Now, this is a very interesting impact. Um, as I said, basaltic achondrite, that doesn't mean an awful lot, but the clue is in the name basaltic because we believe that this material is comes from this particular asteroid, which is 530 kilometers in diameter and is large enough that there will have been some processing of this early solar system material. And so this, we believe, is made of the same material as the Eltonin um, impactor. And here is the Eltonin impactor, um, if you like, to, to scale. So well, we can't tell you which of these craters corresponds to this event, but um, we think it comes from there. And that takes us very nicely into the story of um, uh, asteroids, which are crucial, as you might have guessed, to all of this. This is a simulation of um, the solar system showing the asteroids in the asteroid belt here. Um, you will see the white things are the planets. Uh, Earth is close to this green line. This is the Earth. Um, uh, there's Mars and Jupiter, you can see skimming along the bottom here. Now, the yellow things, and you will see they extend quite far out, are called Earth crossing asteroids. And what, you, the, what I want you to understand here is that this whole asteroid belt is being continually stirred, collisions take place. I mean, I'm talking on long time scales here. And so this is a very active region. Anything that crosses the Earth's orbit has the potential to strike the Earth. Now, I want to say something briefly about asteroids. So let's just look at this diagram here. This is blue thing is the orbit of the Earth around the sun. So that is the plane of the Earth's orbit. And here is an asteroid on an orbit, on its elliptical orbit, also around the sun. Uh, where it's red, its orbit is above the plane of the Earth's, and where it's black, it's below the plane. And the two parameters we're interested in is the eccentricity, which is the amount it's elongated, if you like, that's the definition of the eccentricity, and the inclination, that's the inclination of the plane of the asteroid's orbit to the Earth's plane. And so we see here a plot for, oh, I don't know how many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of asteroids, their inclination, and their eccentricity. So eccentricity of zero is, uh, is um, a circle. Uh, eccentricity of one is you know, a straight line. So you can see a little bit of structure here. Now, this is what's called the instantaneous. If we would go out and measure this object whizzing around today, this is, these are the two parameters we'll measure. But if we do a time averaging, uh, which we do in a computer over 100,000 years, and use the time averaged inclination and eccentricity, we see there is quite a lot of structure in this diagram. And what do these correspond to? Well, clearly clumps of asteroids that have more or less the same properties. And one in particular, we can correlate the existence of a large asteroid with a clump of associated asteroids. Now, what we deduce from this, or what the dynamicist deduces, that in order to create this pattern, we need a 10 kilometer sized asteroid to collide with another similar one every 10 million years or so. Because, and then we get this debris that all has about the same velocities. And these families last for about 100 million years. And then, um, because they're continually being perturbed by the, um, the gravitational effects of the planets and in particular Jupiter. So this is an ongoing process, and these correspond to collisions that have taken place um, within the last 100 million years or so. In particular, there are a group of three um, groups of asteroids that, have, um, that are currently orbiting within or close to the Earth's orbit. There's the Sun, there's the Earth, and there's Mars's orbit. And um, what happens is that after a collision, 
um, the, the fragments can feel the effects of Jupiter. They come into resonance with Jupiter. Their orbits are changed. They're made more eccentric. So they move out of the asteroid belt into the inner solar system where the effect of these planets um, is to recircularize these orbits. So what we are looking at are three groups of um, asteroids um, that have these names associating them with particular things. The Amours have about 7,000 members, including Eros, that is 20 kilometers in diameter. The Apollos here have about 10,000 members, including the Chelyabinsk uh, object, and the Atons about 1,800. That's all we know for the time being. Now, what is going to happen here is that these orbits they're, they're perfectly stable on the timescale of our lifetimes, but they are unstable on timescales of between a million and 10 million years. That means that they're either going to get chucked out, they're going to go into the sun, or they're going to collide with one of the planets. So that is, so what we're looking at here is a very dynamic situation. Now, all this, along with the observed impact that you may remember in 1994 of a comet Schumacher-Levy 9 with Jupiter that was seen around the world, raised awareness that we really ought to start worrying about these things, that stuff happens. And we've seen stuff happen before, and it'll happen again. And this led to this um, NASA Authorization Act, among one of the many things they were tasked to do was to detect, track, catalog, and characterize all objects greater than 140 meters with perihelions less than 1.3 astronomical units. The, the Earth's distance is one astronomical units. And they said 90% to have been found within 15 years of signing. So, um, and that's of course last year, 2020. And that led to a flurry of observations. Um, people contracted all over the world using relatively small telescopes um, and satellites to look for these things. You don't need a powerful telescope to detect near-Earth objects. And uh, in latter years, this PanStars telescope, um, which has um, a, a much higher um, observation rate and a good field of view, has um, run, dominated the discoveries. So what does the situation look like today? So this is the cumulative number dis discovered as a function of time. So let's concentrate on the one kilometer and above objects. They're marked in red here, and you will see with some um, satisfaction that the number of one kilometer sized objects is hardly increasing at all. Maybe it's not even increasing. What does that mean? It means we've discovered most of them. And the bottom line is none of these are going to collide with us in the next um, uh, 100 years or so. So there may be about 1,100. But remember, the Tunguska event was probably only 50 meters in diameter. NASA said, well, the government said NASA must discover all the ones greater than 140 meters in diameter, which is shown by this orange area here. And you can see this is still rising, whereas the total numbers are rising even faster. So we're a long way. Maybe we've got 10,000, maybe there are 100,000 out there. So we're a long way from discovering them all. But that is going to change somewhat at the start of 2003 with this um, large synoptic survey telescope, as it's called. Uh, it has an 8.4 meter diameter mirror and it is designed, it will be sighted in Chile at um, about, oh, um, um, can't quite remember um, what latitude. Uh, uh, and well, it will be able to see the sky from about uh, 30 degrees north to um, the South Pole, and it will observe the entire sky every few days or so. 
um, over 10 years, it'll, it'll get about 900, nearly a thousand images of every part of the observable sky. And they anticipate in the first year, it maybe will find 9,000 or so new near Earth objects. And this will raise a slight problem because at least three per week will initially be potential impactors. Of course, what you have to do is refine your observations so you get more and more accurate orbits so you can tell whether they're really going to impact or not. So um, if you're the sort of person that has nothing much to worry about and life's a bit dull, then I recommend you, you check this website, the Century Earth Impacting Monitoring. It is updated every, um, every day and a bit with the new asteroid, the new known threats, and it gives you the probability of impacts, but maybe you should focus on the Torino scale here. Um, if you see noughts, then no consequence. One war warrants careful monitoring, and occasionally an object appears with a one here. If you see a 10 here, well, just um, don't even bother writing your wills. The whole lot's going to come to a dramatic end. So there you are. You can check for yourself whether there are any threats. So let's see what happens when we do actually um, find one of these objects. And this is a case guy called Richard Kowalski was coming to the end of his observations in 2008 um, using the Catalina telescope. And he saw this rapidly moving object, which he realized was very close and was a potential impactor. So what happened? And this you may find reassuring because these things will not be kept a secret. So here he is, 639, he observes the object, he reports it to the Minor Planet Center, who notify the jet the community at large, which results in 570 observations from 26 observatories around the world, which feeds data into this. So JPL predict an impact in Chad and notify NASA. Now, NASA has a press release at 21.30. Um, I think these will be um, American time. And NASA notifies the National Security Council, Office of Science and Technology, Department of State, Department of Defense, Joint Space Operations, and of course, the president. I'm not quite sure what would happen in the UK. Somebody would probably go around to number 10 and and Boris or somebody would say, well, what is an asteroid? Do we have to worry? And nobody would be quite sure. Anyway, in less than 24 hours, the impact occurred. Now, the impact didn't occur over Chad. It occurred over northern Sudan. And it was seen, this is a Meteosat image, and um, it, it wasn't a, a very big object. It was about, point, about one kiloton in total. Um, the flash was seen by a jumbo jet heading north, about 400 kilometers um, south of this uh, place, heading up uh, from South Africa. And a flash was seen on Red Sea um, um, beach resorts in the, um, on their security cameras. So, but this was the first time we had observed an object and then uh, in space and then uh, recorded its impact. And this image shows the kind of cloud that was the debris trail that has been now scrambled by the, um, by the upper atmosphere winds. And um, it, it exploded high in the atmosphere, which suggested it was quite um, um, uh, small and quite fragile. So this guy, um, Peter Jenniskin set out uh, two months later and, set, and they set busily searched the desert and recovered about 600 uh, fragments of, of this particular meteor, about um, uh, 10 kilograms in all. And um, here you see the team of people um, looking, having the search here he is looking proudly at this object. And this guy is not just checking his mobile phone, he's actually guarding this piece while everybody else gets the bus out of the debris. And to complete the circle um, the, um, of discovery, a, a fragment of the meteorite was given to uh, Richard Kowalski, who'd made the original discovery. 
Okay, we've said something about asteroids, and now I want to say something about comets. Comets are far less predictable and may, in fact, pose the greatest hazard. Now, this looks very complicated, and sad, it, 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 it's less complicated than it looks, um, and we don't have a lot of time to go into all this, but I just want to give you a sense that when we're talking about asteroids and comets and meteorites and zodiacal dust, they're all just part of the same spectrum of material left over from the formation of the solar system. And it's just the name depends on the size of the object. Now, but so there was, when the solar system was formed, a lot of material was scattered out to the Oort cloud that's about two light years or so away from the sun. So objects here are very loosely held by the um, uh, sun's gravitational field and easily perturbed by passing objects. So objects from the Oort cloud, comets will take maybe 20 million years or so to make their way into the inner solar system. Once they get into the inner solar system, they then feel the effects of the planets, in particular Jupiter. So they can be on an orbit that brings them in from the inner solar system. If they come from the Oort cloud, they're likely to have large inclinations. They will feel Jupiter, their orbits will be changed, and then they will orb or they always orbit around the sun. And Halley, for instance, is a typical example of such a comet. They may have periods between 20 and 200 years. Now, beyond the solar system, and you, you see Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, we have the Kuiper belt, which is, if you like, a disk of debris that never actually formed into um, large planets. Pluto is an example of one of these objects. And these objects can also come into the inner solar system, where again they interact with the planets, interact with Jupiter. Some of them then get muddled up inside the inner solar system. Some of them collide with the sun, and some of them are scattered out. Now, so you can see this is again a very ongoing process of mixing. Now, here is an example of a centaur. 200 kilometers across. Now, fortunately, this object has attached itself to Saturn, and it now appears as a satellite of Saturn. I should have perhaps said in this region here, this once objects get into this region, this is dynamically very unstable. They, the, they, the objects cannot retain a stable orbit here because they're feeling the effects of these planets. So this one got locked up onto, um, onto Saturn. And the next object, this one here, is about five kilometers across, Comet Wild. And in back in 1974, it changed its orbital period from uh, 43 years to six years as an as you know, a result of interacting with Jupiter. So it's an example of um, how these changes take place. And some of you will perhaps remember the great comet of 1997, Hale-Bopp. This is on a 2000 year period, and it maybe has a head that is 40 to 60 kilometers in diameter. Now, the problem with comets is they contain a lot of volatile material. And as they come within the orbit of Jupiter, the effect of the sun is to heat the volatiles. This has two effects. It creates jets that alter the orbit of the comet, um, and it also can result in their breakup uh, because comets are intrinsically uh, quite fragile objects. And here we see um, an infrared satellite image of the comet uh, Schwarzman Wachmann 3, which broke up in 1995. So this uh, line here is the direction of its orbit. So all the fragments are traveling along this line and the tails are essentially pointing back to the sun, the volatiles feeling the radiation pressure, feel, feeling the radiation pressure of the, the sun. So we are seeing comets break up. And indeed, um, we can then get the cometary path 
full of debris of ancient comet material. And like the comets that are perhaps still embedded in this or have been totally destroyed, these orbital um, orbits can be move, move around. They feel the gravitational tug of, um, of the planets. When the Earth passes through one of these things, then we see uh, a rather beautiful meteor shower. So, um, and this is a perspective effect. All these objects are traveling parallel to each other in the same direction. We're just looking up at them and the ones coming straight towards us give very short um, um, uh, um, trajectories here and the ones uh, away that we're seeing sideways on appear long. And this is in a uh, layer of the constellation. These are the Leonids in November, 2001. Now, I want to say, you wonder what the punchline is coming soon. There are a, a series of, of um, meteor streams. They're called the Beta Taurids, the Zeta Perseids, the Southern Taurids, and the Northern Taurids. And if you remember the convention, red is when the orbital plane is above the Earth's plane and black is below. Now, they appear at different times of the year in June and July. And these ones strike the Earth during daylight. So we don't actually see them, but you can detect their radar signal. On the other hand, these come in instead of June, July, October, November, and they strike the Earth during nighttime. And you can see they're, you know, they're, they're different and they seem to come at different times of the year. So you think, well, these are completely different um, um, streams. Now, the interesting thing is we believe all these are associated with Encke's Comet. Now, Encke's Comet, again observed with the infrared telescope, is a very faint comet. It's maybe five kilometers or so in diameter and it is very dark. It, it doesn't develop much of a tail. Um, again, the orbital direction infrared shows the dust and the tail there. Now, the intriguing thing is that when we plot, the end of, these are individual orbits of actual um, objects that struck the Earth, representative of those um, torids that we saw and the orbit of comet Enke they show a similarity that exactly corresponds to what we would see if Comet Enke is a fragment left over from a large, a very much larger comet that broke up about 5,000 years ago. So what we are looking at here is evidence for an object that um, has the potential um, to do quite a lot of damage to the Earth, may well have done so in the past, may well do so in the future, because this orbit is evolving at the moment. It goes, I think, above the Earth's plane, below the Earth's plane. But in a thousand years time, these, this comet will intersect. And part of the punchline here is that the Tunguska object of 1908 appears to have an orbit that is identical to this family of orbits. So we don't have to be actually in the path of the comet. And just where the, the Brazil comet, I didn't tell you perhaps was corresponded to, um, a, a Brazil impact corresponded to the comet Swift Tuttle and the Guiana one um, was also associated possibly though we don't know with the Perseids. Whereas Sikotia Leon was a pure asteroid as was um, Chelyabinsk. Um, and there is the Chelyabinsk orbit, uh, which could be very accurately reconstructed from the um, from what we've seen. Now, you may have just felt that I get a bit blurred between my distinctions of asteroids and comets. Well, this is certainly true because we now realize that we can have cometary fragments that are essentially dark, what is the difference? Well, broadly speaking, a comet has a lower density than an asteroid because a comet probably has a lot more water associated with it. But um, we don't really care about the density. It's the mass um, that does the damage. So what, there's no point in finding all these things if we can't do something about them. 
So what um, is to be done? And um, in uh, 2007, NASA produced a report to Congress um, concluding that the best way to divert a comet was by a nuclear explosion. And um, what you have to do is to change the momentum of the comet, so its orbit changes and it moves away from you. But nuclear explosions um, are a problem. These things are of very low strength. So uh, a subsurface explosion, if you deliver the, the warhead, would uh, destroy the asteroid or comet or whatever it is. But if you don't change the momentum significantly, you just get a pile of debris in, instead of one object and the total energy um, that's dissipated is still going to be the same. Um, again, a surface explosion has that problem. A standoff explosion is about a tenth of as effective um, because you are relying on the X-rays and neutrons essentially to provide the impulse to divert the um, divert the comet. Now, there are also a lot of problems associated with this. You have these things are traveling at high speed. You've got to launch the object, your warhead, and deliver it. So there's a big trade-off between selecting the warhead, selecting the rocket, um, and getting an intercepting orbit. Now, there is, if you like, um, the British way of doing things, uh, I'm being a bit flippant here, which is using the energy of the sun. Now, we could take uh, an object here, which I have by way of example, I don't know why I chose these, 560 meters, a rock, velocity of 15 kilometers a second, see the kinetic energy is 20 megatons, and you can work out the momentum. Now, we can use the sun's radiation in two ways. We can erect a reflector. We can use, sorry, we can use the momentum of light, the, um, uh, the radiation pressure, if you like. We can uh, erect a reflector. And as you know, the crucial thing is force times time. Um, uh, um, a reflector, one kilometer square, will, will feel at the distance of the Earth, 9.1 Newtons force on it. And so we could design to deal with this object a kilometer square of sail, um, which a mylar would weigh about 7,000 kilograms, there are more fancy materials that might uh, weigh less. And um, over 32,000 years, we would deliver the same uh, force times time equal to this momentum. Now, we don't have 32,000 years, but if we have 32 years, then we could change the velocity, the momentum by one part in 1,000 or so, which would be enough to divert it if we know the uh, orbit accurately enough. Now, you can even paint the um, asteroid with black or white paint. If the light is reflected, then you get twice the momentum. And if it's um, absorbed, you, you get half the momentum. Um, so you can, by treating the surface, you can um, alter the effect of radiation pressure. And in fact, one has to allow for radiation pressure for the smaller asteroids. And if you think that's fanciful, we find that there are a, a number of asteroids that spin up and that's because the radiation pressure is, 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 they're acting as a sort of windmill and they rotate faster and faster till they actually break up. So radiation pressure is important. The other way of doing it is not to use the momentum, the pressure, but to use the energy of the sun. And then we can build a gravity tractor. And if we hold a 10 ton mass, about seven meters above the surface, um, and to, in order to do that, we have to have our little iron rockets here, which are powered by 68 square me uh, meters of solar panel to power the tractor. Then again, over the 32 years, we can apply a force for a time that will sufficiently direct the object. And that is because, of course, we get a lot of warning for a lot of these objects. So, you know, these are the kind of strategies we could do. Interestingly, um, uh, Carl Sagan way back, um, um, I don't know when, in the 70s was it, said that we should not 
to discover or do research on how to deflect asteroids until we had to. His argument was that if we did, somebody would use it as a means of aggression. I think the motivations today are more to um, mine asteroids than use them as targets. Now, what about comets? Comets appear with little warning, move fast on parabolic orbits. They're unpredictable, their orbits, because of their jets. They may break up, leaving streams of dust and boulders, and so on and so forth. So what do we do about comets? Well, frankly, we can't do anything. Just take cover and carry on. And of course, we don't know when the next comet's coming, but there are not so many comets around, so perhaps we don't have to worry too much. Uh, just to now wrap it up very quickly, um, when we look at objects and the Earth, something less than 30 meters in diameter will, will airburst with no effect at the ground, um, like many of the things we saw. 30 to maybe 100 and 150 meters uh, will airburst with serious ground damage, like the Tunguska um, uh, uh, impactor, and from a kilometer and above, the results are catastrophic. So what can we say? Well, nothing larger than a kilometer is going to impact the Earth in the next 100 years. Um, and by, oh, I don't know, 2035, we should have detected most of the objects larger than about 140 meters. So where does that leave us? Well, we can expect a Tunguska-sized object every 100 to 1,000 years, impact energy 5 megatons, destructive over 40 kilometers, sunsets, you know, affected worldwide. Highly dis, I mean, if that lands on a city, then that's very serious. If it lands in the middle of Siberia, not very serious. A kilometer sized object every 100,000 years, hundreds of thousands of megatons, that is continent-wide destruction, probably civilization destroying. And when we get to the 10 kilometers, um, tens of millions of years, hundreds of millions of megatons, essentially um, species destroying, climate changing, new geological eras. Now it's happened in the past, it will happen in the future. And on that happy thought, I will end now. Thank you very much. Okay, Mike. Thank you, Robin, that was uh, absolutely smashing. Could I ask you to unshare your screen? Um, I'll unshare my screen, stop and, uh, sharing, yes. Fabulous. And well, it, it's uh, the good news is that um, I shall probably um, pop my socks before we get struck by anything, which is reassuring. I mean, there are all sorts of hazards, but clearly being struck by something from space is not going to bother me too much, or those of us of a certain age. Uh, but it does bring home very quantitatively the nature of uh, the risk, which is very helpful. And of course, totally fascinating for us to hear you talk in terms of uh, tens or hundreds of millions of years uh, and I was rather fascinated by the idea that people might nip up and paint the uh, uh, the asteroid to deflect it a little bit the idea of people nipping up to do a bit of painting yes <laughs> word. Um, now look uh, they are thank you so much for that just a great uh, better than a fill-in uh, absolutely fascinating in its own right um, people the the old lags uh, will know the um, the rules of engagement um, please don't use the chat. Uh, please raise your hand uh, or talk on the Q&A um, uh, or, or write on the Q&A your question. Um, uh, and we'll do our best to read them out. If you would like to be on the telly uh, and speak uh, so that we can all see you, raise your hand and, and Valerie Anderson, who's behind the scenes, will bring you in. Um, but uh, otherwise, I'll try and read out as accurately as I can the questions that come in uh, yes. in form. So um, here we are, let's start. Um, uh, we have um, uh, Vitaly, a physics master from the Primakov uh, Gymnasium in Russia. Ah. Uh, you said you can predict the frequency uh, of the fall of large objects, asteroids, uh, and gave an example of 33 years and 300 years at the same time, the places where the asteroids fall in various light asteroids have been studied. Is it possible to predict with some approximation the next fall of a large asteroid? 
Uh, and are there international programs to prevent the falling, the threat of asteroids and comets falling? And I think you've given us a glimpse of some of that. But yes, uh, well, the bottom line is no, we cannot uh, predict uh, the next fall. You, the, the the one fall that we did predict, which. I mean, potentially, we hope to in the future, was that small object that was detected uh, and struck the Earth within 24 hours, less than 24 hours. And I suspect that is going to be the nature of what happens, um, at least for the next few years, that there are far more undiscovered objects than there are known ones that are small, that are Tunguska sized. When it comes to kilometer sized, then we can confidently say there are no none threatening the earth. And so we don't have to worry about predicting those. And the sentinel tables, if you examine them, you will see that they, there are some quite clever statistics comparing the probability of that object striking compared with the probability of some yet undiscovered object of similar size. But the bottom line is, no, we can't predict where they're going to happen. And probably we won't um, be able to do that until it's very close to happening. If you think I said the Tunguska meteor object had struck three minutes later, the Earth traveling at 30 kilometers a second would have meant it would have struck over Europe. So you get some idea of the intrinsic uncertainties. You've got to know arrival time within minutes or better, and that's pretty difficult. Yes, and I get, guess the lady in the Chevy was pretty relieved that she wasn't <laughs> uh, traveling a bit more slowly, or she could have been in trouble. Um, I have a, a question uh, on the video, please. Uh, John Cook, would you like to? Ah, hi, John. Yes. Hello, Robin. That was a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have not so much a question as a comment or an addition. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the, the NASA program to, um, uh, to look at the orbital elements of these um, objects. And in Shropshire, there's a charity called Space Guard. Yes. Of Knighton, which I managed to visit a, a few years ago. And I would recommend anyone to go and visit there. And they have a couple of telescopes, one of which I think came from Cambridge. It did indeed, yes. Uh, helping to check the, the orbital elements. And they have the most fascinating display. So I can thoroughly recommend that for people who want more information and want more hands-on, in fact, with um, with meteors, meteorites and things like that. But, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, good. Yes. Robin, I, I, I wonder, are we, have we got enough astronomers? I, I've always rather <laughs> thought of astronomy as um, a, a, a rather fascinating um, thing to be interested in. Uh, but I think you've brought home the practical importance of it this evening. Uh, have we got enough astronomers? Do we need more? Oh, of course we need more, but we need somebody <laughs> to fund them. Now, of course, that large LSST telescope um, that, that's going to find so many of these objects. I mean, if you talk to most astronomers, they won't even know it's going to do that. And if they did, they think it's a waste of time because what they want to do with it is to look for, I don't know, merging neutron stars, discover the nature of dark matter and vacuum energy. So, you know, a lot of these things have to be done jointly. And this um, near earth object business is very specialized field. I mean, it's not one I'm involved in, it's one I take an interest in, obviously. But um, no, we need more astronomers, but somebody has to pay their salaries. <laughs> Well, I, I guess I should have expected that answer, really. Uh, and, but one more question. What, where are the, the really exciting things? Where, where are the boundaries of this subject now? Um, what are, are people, what is the next big question? Um, well, it's, you mean in terms of near Earth objects and the, the, well, the things I've been talking about tonight, um, do you, uh, rather than astronomy at large? I, uh, I well, both really, but I was actually thinking of astronomy at large. Uh, yes. was, oh, yeah. well, astronomy at large, the big challenge is trying to discover what, you know, 90 something percent of the universe is made of. The, the mysteries of what is the nature of dark matter? 
what is the history of the evolution of the universe? What is the nature of this dark energy? And um, we are using these huge survey telescopes to try and observe uh, hundreds of millions, if not billions of galaxies to see how they cluster as we look deep into space. And that should give us clues as to how the universe is being expanding and so on. So yeah, those are the big questions around the Institute of Astronomy. Um, I mean, there's a lot of work on exoplanets, you know, finding planets like the Earth and so on. For some reason, I don't get quite as excited by that. I don't know why not. I see, oh, there are some Q and A's. I see four there on under Q and A. I don't know if we can, if anybody's got a question there. Um, are those questions or? Oh, you've gone silent, Mike. Yeah, um, sorry, that was very naughty of me asking my questions ahead <laughs> of our audience. Uh, Jerry Stone says, um, hi Robin, long time no see. Uh, you said the Tunguska body was about 50 meters in diameter. I've always seen it quoted as being a fair bit larger than that. Yes. Uh, look at where the PDS is 100 meters. Has there been yes. a recent climb of its size? Well, the, um, really the experiments done with the Sandia lab um, showing where I simulated or showed the simulation of the explosion, the larger objects uh, essentially produce too big a bang and that explosion would have impacted on the ground, the fireball, there'd have been much more destruction. What we think is that a lump went into Lake uh, Checo, but the actual explosion that took place at uh, six kilometers or so um, was well described by a mere five megatons, um, which meant a smaller object. And as I said, of course, the slightly worrying thing about that, the smaller the object, the more there are of them. So yes, you're quite right. And of course, um, what I haven't emphasized is that asteroids come, uh, objects, near Earth objects come all the way from things with very low densities, very low coherence, maybe density of 1.6, lot of space, lot of water, grains of sand, up to um, iron nickel um, cores that were densities of five or six, I don't know, um, that came from um, uh, uh, asteroids that actually melted their cores. So um, for a given size, you can have a big difference in energy. We think um, Tunguska was on the fluffy um, cometary um, scale from the lack of debris. Uh, fluffy comet, that's a fascinating concept. <laughs> uh, Phil Bowden um, asks, I understand the Earth passed through the tail of Halley's Comet uh, in 1910 without any ill effects. Would yes. it simply kind of day affect our communication satellites, say? Um, I, that's a good one. Um, the, the tails of comets tend to be ionized gases and a little bit of dust. Um, the tail is usually, yeah, um, and it's at a very, very low density. I mean, there was a great panic in 1910. Well, some people were saying, you know, whether cyanide are uh, dangerous uh, lethal gases and con men were selling pills to protect people. Um, I, I suspect for near um, Earth satellites, it would have no effect. You probably find the density in a comet tail is less than the density at 600 kilometers above the Earth's surface. I mean, I'm just guessing that because densities do fall off. Um, for, comet, for satellites at Lagrangian points, I don't know, it might make a difference to communication. Probably not, because they're already feeling the effects of the solar wind. So I would say no, that would be my guess. Fine, thank you. Um, William Baines um, says, do I remember right that most of the 20th century bolide, if that's correct pronunciation, impacts happened in the morning, especially around dawn? If so, is this a coincidence or the result of orbital mechanics? Um, well, it is. If you think the Earth is um, whizzing along, it's, it's heading around the sun at 30 kilometers. 
um, a second. Now, and think of the Earth rotating on its axis. Uh, well, I can't do this very well on the screen, but the point is, as we come into morning, as the sun is about to rise, we are on the leading edge of the of the Earth. So yes, so we're 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 at the bit that's heading along the orbit. So indeed, um, we are we will see on average more impacts in the morning before sunrise, round about then. So yes, you're right, there is um, an effect. For the very large objects, probably not, but for um, smaller objects, yes. I mean, otherwise for a lot of these meteor showers, because we're bowling along at 30 kilometers a second, um, we get through that tube of debris really quite quickly within a matter of hours. So, um, when it comes to things like the Leonids, the actual timing of our interception is more important than whether we're at the leading edge. But other things being equal, yes, more impacts before sunrise. Right, so you've got to get up in the morning if you want to see one. Yes. Uh, Martin Williams says, can we take into account extrasolar system objects such as Oumuamua? Um, well, Oumuamua is a bit of a mystery. Um, it's a lot of people, um, it seems to be widely believed that it comes from outside the solar system, and perhaps it does. When I was a lad, um, we were taught that there is nothing greater than, was it 72 kilometers a second is seen in the vicinity of the Earth, and that was from extensive radar observations. But I have to say that um, Oumuamua is only a few kilometers over that. And I do also hear talks of inter, uh, inter solar, interstellar gas that um, uh, comes or particles that come into the solar system. So there's no reason why we shouldn't have objects coming in um, because when the sun was born, it was born out of dust and gas clouds with a lot of other stars and um, stuff at the edge of our solar system is very loosely held. So yeah, there's no reason why we shouldn't find more of these objects. Um, I think um, uh, not nobody around the Institute of Astronomy thinks Amur Amur is anything other than an asteroid. There are astronomers around who think it's something visiting from another civilization. I don't buy that at all. Well, that's pretty unambiguous, thank you. Uh, Michael Howell um, uh, says there's a film called Melancholia, which suggested there could be a hidden planet behind the sun. What possible real set of events could make such a large object exist that could hit the Earth? Ah, well, <clears throat> that's a very tricky one. If you want to pop something behind the sun, then broadly speaking, it has to be at the Earth-Sun distance. So, because um, it's always got to stay out of sight from the Earth, so it has to be on a complementary orbit to ours. If there was such an object, um, we would certainly have detected it um, by its effect on the other planets. Um, we would have actually seen it when we went to Saturn, because when you go to Saturn, you can look back and you can see the Earth, those dramatic pictures. So it wouldn't have been able to, ah, we'd have seen around the sun and there it would have been. And we also have satellites looking at the sun that are looking about 90 degrees apart, so they would have seen it. So I don't think there's any chance of that. People talk about the possibility of there being a large object in the Kuiper asteroid belt. Um, you'll remember Pluto, which is actually smaller than the moon, but it's still pretty big as objects go. Um, that was thought to be a planet, but we now call it just a large member of the Kuiper asteroid belt. So we, so I'm sure there are Pluto-sized and perhaps even bigger things lurking out beyond um, uh, Nep um, Neptune's orbit in the solar system. And there have been stars that have passed relatively close to us um, within a few uh, light years that, um, yeah, we see from the Gaia catalogue, we can see, run their motions back. Yeah. Almost touching distance. Um, Robin, we should 
we should let you escape. Just one more uh, factual question. My apologies to those people for whom we don't have time. Uh, Peter Clark asked, was the Earth's water derived largely from comets? Ah, that, well, that is an interesting question. And we don't seem to have resolved that. I keep, I mean, what would I, if, if I'd been asked um, on average, I would have said over the years, yes, um, maybe half our water comes from comets. Um, but, uh, and that is partly based on looking at isotope ratios, but uh, opinions seem to change and I don't think we know the answer. I think there's no doubt when we see water on, I mean, ice on craters on even Mercury, we see ice on the moon. I think everybody's confident that that came from comets, cometary collisions. So I think bottom line, probably yes. Um, water, quite a bit of water may well have come from comets, but I don't think we know the def definitive answer to that. Well, a, a fascinating note to end on. It never occurred to me for one moment that water came from comets, but there's been so much fascinating in this talk, Robin. Um, uh, as a stand-in, uh, it was outstanding, if you know what I mean. Thank uh, you. <laughs> um, uh, and I shall look at the stars back of my house uh, with renewed fascination. Uh, and thank you for giving us a glimpse, not just of the mechanics of all of that, uh, but the very practical things that you can now do to give us some measure of the risk associated, which I'm sure crosses people's minds. Not oh, yes. So thank you so much. Uh, you. Good night, everybody. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks. Bye. Bye.